Hello, welcome again to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, and talking about new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Jeff Zwerink. Today we're going to explore Homo naledi and birds that carry water. But before we get into that discussion, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, Reasons to Believe, Follow us on social media at rtb underscore official so that you can be informed of our new videos and other content we produce. Fuzz, good to have you here today. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to let you start off the show because you're talking about Homo naledi, which is, I assume, one of these uh, ancient human hominins. Yep. So go ahead, take yeah, it away. Yeah, qu quite a bit of uh, excitement about Homo naledi in the last few weeks, so thought it would be worth talking about it. But to ease us into the, into the discovery... You know, our friend uh, Ken Samples uh, has told me, and, and Ken is a, a theologian and a philosopher, that he thinks one of the greatest stories ever told was told by Plato. And so here's a, just to get us in the mood, here's a, a, a statue of, of Plato. But he told the story or the allegory of the cave. Okay. Maybe you've heard that. In, I have in heard that a little bit. Uh, kind of illustrates that. And the story is really designed to highlight the importance for each person to acquire knowledge and to develop the ability to reason and to use logic. Uh, really, it's an advocate, he was advocating for his discipline of philosophy. Hmm. And the story is about these prisoners that were chained inside a cave, deep in a cave, where the only thing they could see was the cave wall. Okay. And th there was an opening to the cave that illuminates the wall from time to time. And if uh, people pass by or animals pass by, those shadows are cast onto the cave wall. Hmm. And so all they know about reality are those shadows. And these, you know, denizens in the cave, you know, characterize the shadows. They discuss what they're all about. But that's their understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the prisoners break free of their chains and they escape the cave. They climb to the top and to the opening. And now for the first time, they're confronted with the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a three-dimensional world. The light is bright. It's disorienting. It's uncomfortable. And, and some of them embrace this new insight into reality okay. and leave behind their limited perspective. Mm, all right. But others are so uncomfortable that they end up climbing back into the cave and will spend the rest of their life looking at the wall in the shadows. So it's kind of this okay. allegory about, again, the importance of, of, you know, really knowledge and in learning how to uh, discover knowledge. Gotcha. You know, and being willing to be uncomfortable as we move towards the truth. Well, ironically, there are paleontologists who argue that if we really want to have insight into the origin of humanity, if we really want to illuminate uh, information about our origins, instead of coming out of the cave, we we have to go down into the cave. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, 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 I'm and, assuming that's not metaphorical. <laughs> yeah, it's it, in actuality, and 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 study you know the the hominin remains that are uncovered in these caves, and uh, one of the caves that's in question uh, that has gained a lot of prominence in the last five or six years is a cave system called the Rising Star Cave System that is located in South Africa, just mm. outside of Johannesburg. And it's part of a national park that is a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, called the, uh, the Cradle of Humankind. Mm -hmm. And these cave systems uh, oftentimes are explored recreationally by spelunkers. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, a, a group of uh, cavers entered into a chamber in the rising star cave system and discovered all of these hominin remains. Hmm, interesting. And they went to the University of Witzwatersand and reported what they found to a paleoanthropologist by the name of Lee Berger, who's a fairly prominent, high-profile paleontologist that has kind of this knack for making a splash, okay. you know, <laughs> with the work that he does and really drawing quite a bit of attention to himself and to his research efforts. And so he assembled a team that went into the cave and they ended up discovering a new hominin species called Homo naledi. Oh, and cool. and um, the, the next slide shows uh, a little bit about what they discovered 
in a chamber in the cave called the Dinaletti Chamber. They unearthed about 1,500 fossils uh, that corresponded to roughly 730 skeletal elements. So they had okay. nearly complete skeletal remains for Homo naledi. And uh, this, these remains seem to be uh, encompass about 15 individuals that ranged in age from old to near infancy. Okay. So it's a, an incredible fossil find just in terms of the the breadth of, of you know the the specimens that were available to them. Not to take anything away, but is this the cave? This was a fairly challenging cave yes. to get into, correct? Yeah. Are you going to talk about that? It's oh yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll, because I, I'll that, wait for you to say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that's right, and it's and that has a lot of bearing on how uh, Homo naledi is being interpreted. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So. Yeah, and so um, this next slide shows. Uh, a little bit about the anatomy of Homo naledi that was pieced together. The brain size is relatively small, about the size of a chimpanzee's. And uh, so, so what's that? Uh, you know, humans are like twelve hundred. It's cc's. in the four hundred. Four hundred. Okay. Yeah, so, four hundred cc all right, range. So significantly smaller. Yes. Okay. And the size of Homo naledi was a little bit over four feet. In, all right. In, in and. Yet, even though the brain was small, the face looks very much like that of a, a member of the Homo genus. Okay. The, the upper torso and the upper limbs look very much like an Australopithecine, which indicates that this creature had the capacity to move through trees. It's called arboreal locomotion. Mm -hmm. uh, it had hands that were very human-like, and there were no there was no evidence of tools at the site. Uh, but given the hand structure, it looks as if this creature would have had the dexterity to manufacture and manipulate tools. Okay. Uh, also, its lower, uh, the lower limbs look very human-like, so it looks like it had the capacity to uh, to engage in human-like walking, oh, human-like okay. locomotion. So, so, so it seems like it kind of. It has this kind of the way you're describing kind of sense of a tr you know transitional form in some yes. sense that it's got the I can swing in the trees like apes or I can walk on the ground like humans type yeah. thing. So yeah, and in fact, uh, when this hominin was discovered, there was no dating initially of the remains, and the estimates were on the morphology, on the anatomical mm -hmm. features, that this creature would have um, lived about two million years ago. That's when you would expect to see that kind of transitional form. And in okay. fact, at that time, Homo naledi was heralded by Lee Berger as the transitional form that uh, gave rise to uh, the early Homo, okay. uh, probably Homo erectus. Now, this is significant because it means it displaced Australopithecus sediba that Lee Berger had recently discovered and touted as the transitional form. And Sediba would have di displaced Homo uh, habilis and Homo rudolfensis as the transitional form. Others have argued Australopithecus afarensis is the transitional form. Cananthropus platyops is another mm -hmm. uh, hominin at that time that has been uh, uh, proposed as the transitional form. You okay. get the idea. So th there was a lot of possible hominins that could have served in that role. But because of these anatomical features, Homo naledi was, you know, declared to be that transitional form. Okay. A few years later, people were able to date uh, the cave site and draw an inference ab about the, the date of the fossils. And to everybody's surprise, Homo naledi dates to about 330,000 years ago to maybe 250,000 years ago. So that's a lot more recent. Than... That's extremely recent. Uh, and it means it would have been a contemporary of Neanderthals, Denisovans, hmm. uh, Homo floresiensis. It would have been also potentially a contemporary of archaic Homo sapiens, maybe even mm -hmm. modern humans if it persisted beyond this particular point in time. Gotcha. So this is, again, rather shocking. And right now, people struggle to know mm -hmm. where to place Homo naledi mm -hmm. in the human evolutionary tree. You know, is this a, a, you know, did it originate 
at very yeah, around two million years ago, and this is just simply an, a side branch, an offshoot that persisted, you know, um, until three hundred thousand years ago or thereabouts. You know, so, so would you? I mean, okay. So you found this. This is dated in the on, on the time scale of let's say four hundred thousand years. If it had been, if this creature had been around two million years ago, is it surprising that we don't have fossil evidence of it? Not necessarily. Okay, so it I could mean, have been much longer ago and just right, stuck around. Is right. That, that's yeah, okay. yeah. That's probably the, what most people would say at this point. All right. But it's it's you know it's highly enigmatic. Yeah. You know when you, you when you have fossils, you know <laughs> that that's when that individual species was mm -hmm. in existence. But the assumption is there probably was a time afterwards and a time preceding that. Right. That this, that that individual species was around. It's just an unknown, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, it again a highly enigmatic species. Now, is that a general statement? Uh, so, okay, so with Homo naledi, uh, you know, just clarifying in my mind here, there's the we know it's around three hundred fifty thousand years ago. We don't know how much after that it persisted or how much before that it was. Is that a general feature of these homo? hominids and australopithecines that there's a time where we know they existed, but a, you know, knowing when and where they started and stopped is a much bigger question. Yeah. That's a general, okay. All that's right. a general, uh, problem. If you want to call it a problem with the fossil record in general. Right. Right. So it, it's, yeah. So, the, you know, that's nothing, you know, scandalous or anything no, no, like that. No, that's fair. And I guess ultimately my question in that is if we're using this to construct you know, trees or branches or whatever we want to call that, if there's big lack of understanding of the range, how well do you know who's connected to what? Yeah, that's a big problem. Okay, so that is just a yeah, known I mean, question. When, okay. when you look at that, you know, trees that are built, you know, to describe human evolution, they're highly speculative. And okay. different paleoanthropologists will draw very different trees from each other. Mm -hmm. And usually new finds will often force everybody to redraw trees, and there's still debate that goes on. You know, in a sense, the process of, of fossil preservation is a highly chant, mm -hmm. it's a process driven by chance. And so it's not a mistake, uh, uh, an accident that a lot of the finds are actually in cave sites where you get conditions that are much more amenable to <laughs> oh, that makes sense. burial and and preservation versus out in the open. You that know, makes and, sense, yeah. and and you oftentimes will get skulls and teeth because those are the most durable part of the skeletal remains. So you're you're fighting the vagaries of chance when you're trying to understand, you know, human origins. So the, not the, I mean this I don't want this to sound like ooh, we just can't trust anything, but it does it seems like there's just an inherent ambiguity in any sort of right. relation we have there that it, it's, they're all, obviously they've got to make sense of the data that's there. But if you've just got that sparse of data as, 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 as I, I can be a little bit just, okay, that's your story. That, that's the story you're painting, but there could be many other explanations that yes. the data just doesn't yes. discriminate against. Okay. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. That's a great way. And, you know, it's it's interesting. Every time you see new hominin fossils found or new hominin species identified, you know, you he see headlines, mm -hmm. you know, this discovery shakes the human evolutionary tree. You know, this changes everything we know about human evolution. Some of that is, you know, journalistic, <laughs> you know, flair to try to attract readers. But you actually see paleoanthropologists make those very statements as well. Okay. You know, and it just highlights how speculative gotcha. all these interpretations are, which is really going to be very important when we start talking about some of the insights about mm -hmm. Homo naledi that, you know, again, are rather surprising. Now, you, you mentioned the cave system, <clears throat> right? And so this is a scientific diagram showing a, a portion of of uh, the rising star cave system. It's a, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, it's a very elaborate cave system. Right. Right. And so where you're, we're focusing on is a chamber called the Dinaletti chamber and this hill anti-chamber, they're, they're in, a, in effect connected to each other. Uh, but, you know, this 
chamber is actually pretty pretty deep within the cave. Uh, and the next slide is a cartoon that kind of highlights okay, that what, it, <laughs> what it, it, it takes to get to the Dinaletti chamber. You have these fairly accessible openings that go down, I'm, I'm guessing about 150 feet, and then you hit this place called Superman's Crawl. <laughs> and the reason why it's called that is because to get through that, you have to have one arm straight over your head and the other tucked to your side, and you kind of inch your way through that. Oh, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a different group of people that want to do this. <laughs> yes, yeah, and so you're you're like Superman in flight right. trying to make your way through there, and then you open into this. And that's got to be like 10 feet long or better. Yeah, yeah. That would be uncomfortable <laughs> yes. to do that, and you'd have to have some assurance that, on the, that you're going to be doing that only for a short distance. And you can actually get out the other side. <laughs> yeah, and then there's this another, there's a large chamber that you enter into, and there's an area called Dragon's Back, which is kind of roughly like a staircase that goes up about 50 feet. Okay. And then there's another passageway that then goes into a chute that drops down into the Dinaletti chamber. And when they discovered the chamber uh, and they sent teams in to then you know, excavate the fossils, they learned very quickly that you had to be fairly small in order oh, okay. to, to fit down into the Dinaletti chamber. So... They they refer to these people as uh, uh, they uh, they kind of called them astronauts in quotes, <laughs> you know, where they had people who had small statures that were able to be the first people into that. Yeah, that and so sense. not everybody can can make their way into that chamber. I, I chose astrophysics well over this. But I would not make it into. Yeah, I'm not sure I could do that crawl, and I'm yeah. not particularly fearful of things, but that just. This yeah. is this is a this is cool. I got to admit. So. Yeah. Well, now this is this is where the some of the interesting things about Homo naledi start to emerge. Okay. Because you've got again these fifteen specimens in the Dinaletti cave, and they seem to be very well preserved. There's no other fossils in the cave mm. other than the 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 you know Homo naledi fossils. Um, they are pretty well articulated. Which, which means, means that the, the skeleton pieces are still joined together or in close proximity oh, wow. versus, okay. versus being scattered everywhere. No evidence that there was any kind of predatory activity modifying the remains. Right. Uh, and so the question is, how did these things wind up getting in here? Right. It's not water <laughs> flowing through the cave, depositing them there. Right. Uh, there's no evidence for that. Uh it's not a predator dragging these creatures into the cave where it's consuming them. Right. Right. So it looks like they were deliberately deposited there as, as a type of burial process. Okay. And, and given how arduous the pathway is into the cave, uh, the, the thought is that, well, you know, perhaps this was done again intentionally mm -hmm. uh, as a type of deliberate burial or a ritualistic burial that suggested maybe Homo naledi had some kind of symbolic capabilities. Okay. Now, there are, there are people that have challenged this, uh, and we'll get into, into some of those challenges kind of all at once. Okay. Uh, but this is another slide um, <clears throat> that just kind of shows, again, what the Dinaletti chamber looks like uh, and kind of the distribution of the remains inside the chamber. So it does look like it is a type of burial ground. Now, whether it was ritualistic or just simply uh, Homo naledi caching the dead uh, is, is mm -hmm. or really, you know, is the question. At, well, know, yeah, it, it seems like one of the questions that comes up is this something where people or, you know, there's creatures that are dragging back, putting it in. I mean, because you got to get in and then get back out, which right. both of those look tricky. Yeah. And or to, is it, it uh, to me, the most obvious scenario off the top of my head is that you've got this set of creatures that are escaping, getting back in there and get stuck or something like that. Yeah. So there, there's, yeah, there's alternate scenarios, but, right. you know, you know, Lee Berger tends to be uh, sensationalistic. No, that's fair, fair point. You know, so. you know and, and, and the pieces of the puzzle, you know, are consistent with his, his story. Right. But it, it, but there's other explanations that might be, you know, more amenable. Now, again, we go back to that uh, cartoon, <clears throat> given how, deep into the cave you have to go and how arduous it is. Lee Berger was speculating, well, Homo naledi must have had some kind of capacity for 
fire use, right? Because how else are you going to illuminate the cave in order to see where you're going? Okay. And um, more recently, uh, and this has not been published anywhere, this is just an announcement he made at a scientific meeting giving a presentation. He argued that they've actually discovered in the Dinaletti cave uh, burnt marks on the ceiling or brown black spots on the ceiling, what he interprets as sputtering of of ash. Okay. You know, and uh, not in Di the Dinaletti chamber, but in the Rising Star cave system, Another anthropologist has made this discovery, which is a hearth that has had burnt antelope bones associated with it. So now Lee Berger is saying, well, this is evidence that Homo naledi actually not only was burying their dead ritualistically, but had mastery of fire. Now, Okay, so so this is another Homo naledi archive or, 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 well, it's or in the, something associated it's, it's with it's in the homo. cave system. Oh, it is in this it is in the same cave system but just in a different area. Just in a different okay, area. All right. Now, and and then there's a Lassetti chamber that John Hawkes discovered additional Homo naledi specimens. Mm -hmm. So Homo naledi seem to have been occupying this cave system. The problem is just because you have black marks on the ceiling doesn't mean it's due to soot. Okay. Right or to burning fires, it could be mineral discolors discoloration due to other processes. It, it you, would seem like that would be fairly easy to test though. Right. And it hasn't been tested. It just hasn't been tested. It right? hasn't been tested. It hasn't been published anywhere. Okay. Right. Uh, you could also, you know, at, you know, isolate the, what you think to be the soot mm -hmm. and, and analyze it to make sure you can do radiocarbon dating on that. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, well, not if it's 300,000 years ago. Well, that's, but see that the problem is, you, it could be that somebody else was in that chamber and was lighting a okay, fire. Okay, so you do the radiocarbon dating, and if you come up with a right. date less than 30,000, right. it wasn't then. If it comes up inconclusive, then you say it's at least got the possibility. Exactly, okay. exactly. And again, it could there could be, you know— you know, modern humans occupying that cave site, mm -hmm. leaving behind the hearth. So, the, you know, it's, right. it's, it, the claim is out of necessity because how else is Homo naledi going to make its way into that cave? And, you know, it, it, it again, um, is highly speculative. It's not right. an unreasonable inference, but it's not the only inference that you could draw. No, that makes sense. And it hasn't been published. Now, uh, we're recording this episode in mid-June, okay. and about a week or so ago, early June, there were announcements by Lee Berger's group of more evidence that added to the case for ritualistic burial, and even the claim that Homo Naledi was making art. Okay. And, and so these are not been published anywhere yet, but they are available as preprints. And in fact, um, the... The story is that all of these articles have been submitted to a journal called eLife. But one of the claims that they have argued for burial is that uh, Homo naledi, or sorry, that is that they found these cavitations in the cave mm -hmm. where there were uh, four juvenile specimens in a fetal position. Now, most of the remains are from a single individual. Uh, but the argument is that because it's a cavitation, it looks like it's a deliberate excavation of the ground okay. where these juvenile, spe you know, members of Homo naledi were placed mm -hmm. as a burial. And then associated with that is this uh, stone tool, maybe. Um, this is a single tool, but it's Same just thing, a, just flipped up yeah, top just flipped, and bottom or over. And where there are these striations that they argue look like maybe they were some kind of manipulations of the tool or okay. it was used to to scrape away something. So the argument here is that this adds to the case that this is a deliberate ritualistic burial. And then we go back to this chamber, that gray flowstone kind that's a forms like a pillar-like structure. They argue that when they examine that carefully, they discovered these markings on it. Uh, that they argue are geometric in shape and therefore is evidence that Homo naledi was making a type of art or proto-art or had symbolic capabilities. So this is the 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 these are the claims that are that are out there. And okay. the question is, you know, how robust are these claims? Now, you know, it's it it seems to me like um, you know, 
the Dinaletti chamber looks to me like a place where dead were deliberately cached. Okay. That's, that's a reasonable explanation, I believe. But we're making assumptions about the, the cognitive capacities of Homo naledi based on assuming that uh, the, the cave structure that, that houses the Dinaletti chamber was then, uh, when Homo naledi was occupying the cave, was the same as it is now. Right, and it's quite possible, for example, that the Superman crawl could have actually been, you know, a, a more open space that kind of closed up over time. There's really good evidence that the dragon back is actually a ceiling fall. So, gotcha. Yeah. And so, when Homo naledi actually went into the cave, it may not have looked like that at all. It could have been just a straight walk in. Oh, well, in a cave, but nonetheless a right. pretty straightforward and, but, walk. And they were going into the chamber. And in fact, um, it, uh, the late Sue Dykes, our, our friend, who did her PhD at University of Witzwatersand, who knew Lee Berger, uh, wrote an email to me in 2015 where she essentially talked about the fact that the geologists that have been into that cave argue that the dragon's back is actually a ceiling fall. Now, what this does, here's a diagram that she sent me along with that email. What that means is that when you come into that chamber, and let's assume that Superman's crawl actually is a little is more open, now you have this open chamber and a 50 feet sheer scale, a uh, wall that you have to scale to get to the chute to drop the remains. Right. It, there's no way... Anybody's going to do that. Gotcha. Okay. Right? So, so it's actually easier to get into the right. chamber now than it was right. back then. So the question is, could there have been another opening into the Dinaletti chamber that would have made it for easy access? Uh, okay. And it could be that maybe, you know, these Homo Naledi were remains were cached, it was dead caching, or could they have been in occupying that and there was a cave fall or a cave collapse right. okay. and they were trapped in there? So the point is that there's alternate explanations. Uh, and then, you know, something else to keep in mind, too, and that is that just because you're seeing cavitations in the floor, it, it's not uncommon to see cavitations in caves. Mm -hmm. And so things that are that fall onto the ground that wind up on the cave floor could potentially make their way into these lower areas. Mm -hmm. And and so that's not necessarily evidence for deliberate burial, right? It could just simply be that this is, you know, where they wound up. And in fact, there's uh, anthropologists have developed a very stringent set of criteria that you have to meet before you declare something a, an intentional burial. Okay. And that includes that the excavation must be deeper than what they were observing there and that the articulation is actually much greater than what you see with those remains and that the body is usual is straightened out so every deliberate burial uh, would be of that sort when you have remains in a fetal position that could have been something that just simply resulted naturally at the time of that individual's death you know, okay, so, so how strong is the idea that it's straightened out? Because, I mean, again, if you just think, okay, yeah. I'm stuck in a cave, the last thing I'm going to do is curl up. One, that keeps me warmer longer, right. gives me a greater chance of survival. That's just kind of a natural place to be, right. as opposed to laying flat out on the floor. Right. In a cave, that's a pretty unnatural position in some sense. So how strong is that? Well, I mean, it's the cri criteria. it's the criteria. So it's I mean, the there, there's okay. this, you know, because the the idea is that you have anthropologists have this rigorous criteria okay. for deliberate burials to avoid calling everything an intentional burial. You know, because so, so how how closely does this meet a deliberate burial? It doesn't meet it. It doesn't. At all. Okay. That's yeah, good. and this right. isn't my assessment. This is articles that I've read by paleoanthropologists who are criticizing this mm -hmm. work who are saying, look, he does the, the, none of the criteria are met. And the oldest burial that we know of is 77,000 years ago, I think in, in South Africa. Okay. And it's an infant or, or, or a juvenile, but it meets all of the criteria. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and deliberate intentional burials oftentimes connote 
a sense of the afterlife, particularly if there are grave goods. Right. You know, if you're burying the dead with items that suggest a sense of the afterlife, uh, and it, you know, it typically connotes symbolic capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, you know, criteria isn't met. Now, in terms of the art, you know, it's very well could be that Homo Naledi put those scratch marks in the wall, but to call that symbolic behavior or proto art to me is a far stretch. You know, I, you could just envision a scenario where, you know, somebody was just simply scratching things. It's, it's not, you know, yes, when you start putting marks randomly on the wall, you are going to make triangles, you are going to make squares or mm -hmm. rectangles. It, those are, it's not the same thing as drawing a very carefully designed circle, yeah. you know, that's inside, you know, another circle or a square or something. So well, that, that, that just kind of, to me, highlights a tension you've got there that, you know, when you're looking at art, the longer ago, your tools are going to be a little more primitive. Your, I mean, you know, just what you're working with is hard to make any sort of permanent thing in it. So you would expect things to look a little more primitive, but where does that go from intentional to not? It just makes that a, it makes that a challenging right. issue. Well, uh, and in in what you end up seeing when you look at the archaeological record is that there is art and then there's no art, right? Hmm. So this is called the Big Bang of art, mm -hmm. and you know, or in the the caves in coast the coastal area of South Africa, there's very clear evidence for symbolism that goes back, you know, at least to eighty you thousand years ago, maybe even older than that. And, you know, the oldest abstract, you know, um, drawing, you know, or, you know, symbolic structure is carved into, it looked like some kind of container that was used for storage. Okay. And it, and it's, and it shows very deliberate patterns that are radically different than this. So mm -hmm. this, this is, it's very yeah, hard. I, to, I was just, yeah, that's... it's very hard. You know, like you know, I had a, a dog that would scratch furniture, yeah, right, and it would make patterns that look like that, you know, and so you can, you know, you can see patterns that may not actually be there. So I, I just find it hard that you would call this art. So, you know, kind of the bottom line is that Homo naledi is definitely this highly enigmatic, mm -hmm. fascinating <laughs> creature. There's all kinds of questions about, you know. How did those remains get into that Dinaletti chamber? Right. What was what was the capability? But you know, if Homo Naledi actually had the ability to make art, to master fire, was doing ritualistic burial, this creates a huge problem for human evolution because everybody, and I mean everybody, had understood that it wasn't until brain sizes got large mm. that those kind of behaviors were possible. And so then they're arguing, well, this means that maybe brain size doesn't correlate with cognitive, you know, sophistication. Maybe, you know, there's other things that are dictating mm -hmm. it or determining it. But yet my point would be, look, we've got all kinds of data that shows brain size is actually important, you know, as, an, as a normative feature. So we, shouldn't we look at the archaeological record in light of the fact that you know, Homo naledi has a diminutive brain size versus arguing that everything that we thought we knew that re relies on accrued knowledge in a number of different disciplines is actually wrong, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, well, it's a fair point. I mean, I'm going to press on that just because, in my simplistic knowledge of biology here, one of the things that stands out to me is that when we were first investigating DNA, or as we've been investigating DNA and trying to understand how does DNA translate into the organisms we see, um, that it kind of makes sense that the bigger, more complex, more advanced creature you are, the bigger your genome is going to be. And it turns out that some of the largest genomes are right. in amoeba. You know, you know, right. they're much larger than human genomes in that right. sense. So our simplistic approach of more complex or right. longer genome allows more complex code just wasn't right. the right way to think about it. And so it turns out, in my assessment, is or in my understanding that. The at some level, you know, with simple organisms, you can add more code and that allows, allows you to do things. But when you want to do more complex features, you got to do more elegant code. Right. And that's going to be shorter 
but have more complexity to it. And that, that kind of makes some sense of the data that's out there. Right. Is there something, a parallel going on here where we think, okay, yes, brain size correlates with cognitive ability, but in reality, it's not kind of like DNA bigger didn't ultimately mean better. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, you know, that is a possibility, right? And, you know, it's not just simply brain size that's important. I will, would grant that point. It's, you know, what does the brain structure look like? And there's mm -hmm. no understanding at all what the brain structure of Homo naledi would have looked like. Now, we do have good understanding of brain structure of other hominins. You can, there are a number of techniques hmm. where you can infer what that the brain structure would have been, more the, the fine details of the brain structure. So, you know, I do agree that um, brain structure is important, not just brain size. But again, it's, you know, everything we know would suggest that that this creature wouldn't have had the cognitive ability to do some of the, mm. the the things that are being claimed of it. Uh, um, and, and you would need, in my mind, much stronger clear-cut evidence for art, much stronger clear-cut evidence for mastery of fire, for deliberate internment of the mm -hmm. dead, before I would say that maybe, just maybe w things are wrong. You know, mm. when, you, when you have, yeah, it, it just surprises me that, you know, you, you, you want to interpret the archaeological record, I think, in light of what we know <laughs> okay. about what, you know, anatomical requirements would be to be able to produce that. You know, for example, if you looked at Homo naledi's hands and you saw hand structure that was very different than what it has, where you would conclude this creature didn't have dexterity, then you would argue, well, it wasn't making tools it wasn't probably using tools. Right. So we do that with other parts of the anatomy, right? Where we say, mm -hmm. hey, look, you know, the, the hands of Homo naledi are dexterous enough that even though we don't see tools here, it's reasonable to think that it was making tools okay. of some sort, right? And, and so that to me isn't unreasonable because you're, mm -hmm. you're going off of anatomical precedence where you understand what does it take right. anatomically no, to engage in a behavior, right? Um, so it seems like where tool use at least flows from, or it's consistent with what we see and what we've learned in the past, it, you're making the case that the cognitive or the, the symbolic features, the, the burying the dead, right don't flow, they're, they're at very best a strain fit with what we know from cognitive studies. Right, oh, exactly. Okay. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, a way to, I mean, you always, you never want to say never or you never want to, <laughs> you know, assert a position with certainty for the very points that you've made. But I think, you know, if, if you're looking at something that is literally going to change a paradigm, mm -hmm. you really want to have a lot more <laughs> robust evidence than what's being presented here you know, in, 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 with Homo naledi, right? So, so as we're in County, I mean, you know, we, we've had a conference talking about human exceptionalism and people arguing that humans are on a, or, you know, there's a continuous chain from, of cognitive development. Based on this, what's your, what's kind of the bottom line or the takeaway in your assessment? Yeah, I mean, to me, why, you know, we should care about this as Christians is one, it's just great science, <laughs> Right. You know, and it's a fascinating scientific mystery. Um, but, you know, to me, it really boils down to the question of human exceptionalism. Right. You know, are we unique as human beings? Do we stand apart from other creatures? Mm -hmm. Right. Whether there is a continuity or a discontinuity, is there something about us that that seems to make us special? Right. And, and this is the idea of human exceptionalism that I think you can connect. You know, at least that's my contention though it's controversial, to the image of God. Mm -hmm. and there are people that would have varying degrees of comfort with that act, that connect, making an attempt to make that connection. But still, you know, are we exceptional as human beings? And if you have creatures like Homo naledi that were just like us or remarkably close to being like mm -hmm. us, it raises questions, you know, are we really unique and exceptional as human beings? Because there is you know, a, a minority of anthropologists that are arguing that we are different in kind, not different in degree, based on the, the biological structures of our brain mm -hmm. and the ensuing capacities. 
So th- this would be one reason why this is important. But right. also, I think it, it begs the question, how should we as Christians think about the hominin fossil record? Mm-hmm. You know, and as an old earth creationist, you know, I look at these hominins as real creatures that existed for a period of time that disappeared, mm-hmm. that they were created by God. I would allow for some microevolutionary variation right. with, that would happen naturally. Uh uh, and that these were creatures that had intelligence and emotional capacities that they just lacked the image of God. And, okay. and so that's how I would see Homo naledi. I don't see anything about Homo naledi that challenges that that you know broad interpretation right. of, of the hominin fossil record. So, you know, this is, you know, why I think this is important. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. It's been a yeah. I, I've just the the bit I've been able to learn listening to you know the late Sue Dykes talk about you know the discovery and how it happened and what it takes and all that there is there. I, this is a fascinating area of research, and yeah. not that it would persuade me to do something other than physics at this point, but mm-hmm. I, it's, it's just really I agree with you. It's just fascinating science. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. So I'm actually going to shift just a little bit from. Uh, uh, over to Southwest Africa and talk about the uh, Namaqua sand grouse. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think, okay, what in the world is a physicist talking about this? Uh, I, just kind of by way of introduction, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, and if you've heard me talk too much, I love lightning bugs. Uh, some people call them fireflies. I always call them lightning bugs. Yeah, I grew up in West Virginia, so <laughs> there was many, many a summer night. Spent. Oh, man. And it's like, you know, it's like you go out and you get your jar and you poke your holes so you have the illusion of giving them air. And <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, what I, the, I just, there's a coolness about a bug whose rear end lights up. And, yeah. you know, I mean, there's a fine tune about it because if you go out too early in the evening, you can't see them because they're not lighting up. But if you go out too late, it's too dark and you can't see anything. And so being able to catch them has this kind of fine-tuned nature to it. But I love doing that. And what I have come to find out later is that the whole process of how this works is really well designed. I mean, think about anything we do that gives off light, even if we're talking about LEDs, which are much lower power consumption than incandescent bulbs, you give off light, it gets hot. And the, you look at the chemical reactions that are going on here and they give off light, but remarkably most of the energy in that chemical reaction goes into the light, not into heat. So Mm -hmm. these bugs can do this without basically frying themselves, which is fascinating. But to me, the the cool part about it was recognizing that this these chemicals mix in a liquid environment inside the bug's abdomen or, or you know, rear end. And then there's this transition out to air where they go. And, and any physicist knows that where you have a change of material, you've got a change in index of refraction. You get a lot of reflection off of that. And as scientists have gone in and studied, they realize that there is a very well-designed scale structure that actually maximizes the transmission of the light out of that liquid environment into the air environment. And all that just really points to me and says, this is not just a ooh happenstance. It's like it's it's been fashioned to happen that way. And one of the evidences of that is that we now go and take what we find in these lightning bugs, apply it to the surfaces we put on LEDs and we increase their light output. Yeah. So it's not just, ooh, cool things we find in nature. We take that, apply right. it to things we've designed and they work better right. than what we could come up with on our own. So that's the context of why are we looking at a bird? And it's this, uh, you know, the structure and mechanics of this water holding feathers of the Namaqua sand grouse. And this bird was, noted, you know, uh, ornithologists were looking at this, and and as far back as 1896, there was a fellow, Edmund Mead Waldo, whose name doesn't mean anything, just for interesting historical reference there, actually was watching this sand grouse, and what would happen, watching particularly the males, but this sand grouse would waddle, or would walk over to water, sit down, you know, be in the water, get up, waddle back, and the chicks would then come up and put their beaks into the underbelly. And his contention was that the they were getting water and then bringing it back so that the kids could get this. Now, or the chicks could get this. Now, so bizarre was this idea 
because birds' feathers are designed to keep water off of the bird. Right. You know, that's you don't want to get wet when you're a bird because one, water is incredibly heavy, yeah. or you know, very dense, and so it adds weight. And feathers just don't work well when they get wet. So to the idea of having a set of feathers that are specific or that gather water for a mm. purpose, it just it was 70 years later. Numbers of observations have come in before this idea really had any credence to it that these birds are actually going over, getting the water, and then taking it somewhere else. And and why that's significant is that as people have been studying and looking at it, uh, using dead birds, they've been able to go and say, you know, put the bird in the water. These sand grouse can carry up to 15% of their body weight in water. And wow. more significantly, very often, especially in Southwest Africa, they will live up to 30 kilometers away from a water source. So what you have is these birds that can fly over, get in the water, the wa their, their feathers will absorb water into them, fly back up to 15% of their body weight, and more than 50% of that water will still be there wow. after that 30-kilometer journey. I mean... Talk about, I mean, you know, just in describing the cave of the Homo naledi, this is just cool, fascinating science. And yeah. so, um, you know, this is a picture of the of the sand grouse, and this is before it's gone in and and collected water. And you see the dramatic change of, wow. you know, what what was just kind of right. streamlined aerodynamic. Now you've got these two large areas where the bird has absorbed a bunch of water. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it can fly with that. That's pretty taxing. 50% of your body weight when you're mm -hmm. a, when you're a bird is pretty significant, but you're carrying this water because it's necessary to do that mm -hmm. to, to transport at these long distances. And so I, I just, I love the, the, the electron micrograph images they have of the feathers and what you see is that these uh, feathers, you know, they've got the spines to them, and then they've got these, mm. uh, kind of what it looks like is a, it's a, almost a, a strip of ribbon that kind of curls around, and the top of the the ribbon and the bottom of the ribbon have a different, they're, they're made of the same structure, but a little, or it's not collagen, but it's like collagen, but if there were two different kinds of collagen that behave differently when they got wet, so that when they get wet, they unroll and, you know, they, uh -huh. they're, they unfurl and collapse as they get wet uh -huh. in this bundle. And so this is a picture of the feather as it's being stuck into the water there on the left, as it's, uh, you, you can see it, everything spreads out and fans out. And then as it withdraws, it curls up on itself and it forms this container for the water. And coupled with the high surface tension of water, you now basically have this feather kind of picking up drops of water. And the part that I find fascinating about this is that the bottom is, okay, stick that back into the water and the process just reverses itself. Hmm. And you know, think how many times we're trying to transport water. It's actually pretty easy, you know, go over, take a bucket, pick the water up, carry it over, dump it out. But that's a fairly mechanically mm -hmm. sophisticated system. You got to find a way to hold onto the bucket. You got to tip the bucket so that you can get it down in the water or stick it down right. in there far enough, which is a trick, and then pull it out. And then to be able to disperse it as well, or to have it stick around for a while is hard. Mm -hmm. And so there's this system that these birds have that is mindless, if you will. It just, bird goes, sits in the water, it absorbs the water, flies back, the water's there, and it will be there for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, we've brought back this bucket of water, we have to use it and store it. It's there as long as it needs to be until it dries up, then the bird can fly back and get more. Yeah. And again, I just, this is, seems to be a recurring theme I see in nature. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in the structure of the lightning bug. I've seen it in uh, th this bird's feather. I've seen it in the way slime molds grow to replicate the movement of nutrients through the right. slime mold. Uh, the ideas we get from the mantis shrimp about how to build eyes and opticals, things like DVDs and CDs that we repeatedly seem to say, hey, there's this structure in nature 
that though we've built something, what nature does is far better. Let's replicate it so that we can make something better. And it just, it's, it just, to me, argues that what we see in nature is not happenstance or right. unguided. It's, there's a purpose there. I mean, if right. it's better than the best things we can engineer often, that's a sign that there's a better engineer out there doing things. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to me that, you know, biomimetics and bioinspiration is one of the hottest areas in engineering right. today. And, you know, the, the reason for that is because the designs in biology are so elegant and so sophisticated. It's a lot of times that they suggest solutions to engineering <laughs> problems that engineers simply can't discover themselves. Right. And so at minimum, it's highlighting just the elegance and the sophistication of biological designs. And, you know, to me, if, if that's the case, that really fits very comfortably in a creation model mm -hmm. design framework, right? Right. You know, that if there's a creator, you'd expect the designs in biology to be elegant and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, biomimetics is a demonstration of that. One of the places, you know, now, now that you're saying that, I remember one of the first examples where I didn't appreciate appreciate it until many years later. And unfortunately, I've not been able to go back because it was in a colloquium I heard when I was uh, working at UCLA full time, is a fellow was talking about uh, nano structures that they were building. And they, they built this ratchet that, uh, you know, it would go around. And I, I very vividly remember his description. It's like, you know, we built this thing that it would work, but we didn't, we couldn't build a motor to drive it. And they were sitting there thinking about how do you build them? Because you know, getting a motor to work on yeah. that scale is hard. And then, and, he, and the his comment in through the set is like, wait a second, what if we took and they took a part out of the cell yeah. of a you know I don't know it's a human cell but out of a cell attached it to this and this thing started spinning around. Yeah. You know, one here we are forefront of our technology and we can build the ratchet or the lever, but to get the engine that drives it, we go into the cell and pull that out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, you know, the, the, to me, this is, I think, a very powerful, you know, argument, not only for design, but really it ra raises questions about whether evolution is the best way to think about biology. Because, what do you, mean? you know, evolution, the way most evolutionary biologists understand evolution is it is this happenstance, unguided process okay. where e evolutionary outcomes are constrained by evolutionary history. And so right. all you can do is take existing designs and co-opt them and modify them to create new designs. Mm -hmm. And so by definition, what you're looking at are these in limited, you know, flawed, imperfect systems. In fact, there's a, a book, a popular book about the philosophy of evolution that's been published by an Italian uh, philosopher of biology, and I, I'm, his name escapes me, but the title of the book is Imperfection, mm -hmm. or Imperfections. And his argument is that, look, you know, my imperfections are just a little bit better than your imperfections, and that, therefore, I'm going to outcompete you. That's, okay. that's how he sees evolutionary history, that it's, you know, these are deeply flawed systems. Well, if that's the case... It might be that occasionally evolution might produce designs that are useful for an engineer, but you wouldn't expect it to be so the, those designs to yeah, be so okay. prevalent that you know you could have a, a scientific discipline or an engineering discipline that's mm -hmm. built around this whole approach, right. uh, you know, biomimetics. Well, and, and I'm struck kind of to your point. I'm struck by how often we look at something and we say. Oh, that's not well designed. Or how, you know, I mean, you know, I'll use the human eye for an example. You know, there, there are just these ideas of oh, there's a bad design out there, and often it's a reflection of our lack of understanding of what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I just know from writing computer code that making the code do what I want is actually not that hard. You know, it's like once I got the algorithm, it's just there's language to put it into place. Making it work robustly is inordinately difficult at times because somebody will type in a number where I'm expecting a string or a string where I'm expecting a number. And my code needs to be able to handle that mm -hmm. and handle it 
robustly or elegantly. Uh, or, you know, I could just work that most of the time it calculates this way, but whatever reason, some variable gets to be zero and then I divide by it. And so putting in place all of the robustness so that it works flawlessly and seamlessly in all environments, well, you think what's going on with organisms. They need to just work mm -hmm. in, in this incredibly diverse array of environments, and it just needs to work all the time, whether the yeah. water's close or whether the water's far away. And to see these designs that where we looked at the human eye and said, well, it's got all the junk in front. That can't be a good design. And then we realized, wait a second, there's a lot more sophistication to that than what we thought. And whether right. we have the final answer or not, it just you look at that and you say, okay, now that we understand it better, what we thought was a bad design is this very elegant design. Right. It may not be optimal in this one way, but it's optimal in that it works in the right. variety of environments it's got to work. Yeah. You know, when, you know, you think about what an engineer has to do, mm -hmm. you know, when you're producing any system of complexity, there's multiple objectives. Right. And they oftentimes can be competing. And so you're managing trade offs. You know, and you're building in redundancies into the design. You know, you're you're creating yes. an, systems that are adaptive. You know, and and so, you know, thinking about biology from an engineering standpoint really highlights designs. And it's ironic to me that biologists will look at trade-offs and they talk about this as being suboptimal and a flawed design versus, oh, managing trade-offs is actually evidence of, of a sophisticated superior right, design yeah. or redundancy in a, in a human design is built in such a way or incorporated in such a way to create robustness to the system, right? right you, yeah. you don't, you don't want to get on an airplane, you know, mm -hmm. where there aren't redundancies so that if a system fails, that there are backup systems that will kick in and, and operate. Right. Right. You well, know. And that costs weight and power, and other things which are competing with the goal of the airplane in the first place, which is to get in the air and transport. So right. I, you're, 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 I think that's a pretty profound point that you're talking about there. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, the designs in biology are, are fascinating <laughs> and they, they only become more fascinating the more we learn about them. I agree. So uh, any further comments? Or no, we, no. That's, well, that's a great discovery, Jeff. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time in Southern Africa today, I guess, <laughs> uh, with uh, birds and ancient hominids. But <laughs> Very good. Well, I want to thank you for joining us on Star Cells and God today. I want to encourage you to join this discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. We release new episodes of Star Cells and God each Thursday right here on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend and remember, the more we know about science, the more reasons we have to believe.